Hi, everyone. My name is Les Velez, and I welcome you to the OPUS interview series. OPUS, the Organization for Paranormal Understanding and Support, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that was founded in 1994. Our mission, simply put, is to help people having paranormal experiences. I'm the co-founder and chairman, and for more information about OPUS, please go to our website at opusnetwork.org. I am very excited and happy to have with me tonight uh, for this interview, Ryan Bledsoe. Uh, he and his dad had one hell of an experience. And so tonight I want him to go through that experience and all the ramifications and all the experiences that they had. So Ryan, welcome. And I really appreciate you being here tonight. Hi, Lester. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate you inviting me and working this out with me, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. So, yeah, kind of, you know, bring us up to speed here, uh, because, you know, I know that a lot of people are probably familiar with you and your dad, Chris Bledsoe's experience, but for those that aren't, can you kind of just go over what happened that night? Sure. So, actually, um, I, at the time when this initially went down on January 8th of 2007, I have to think about the date. Um, it's Elvis's birthday. That's how I always remember it. But January 8th, 2007, I was actually 13 years old. And um, I was a little too young to be out there fishing with my dad and his friends. It was my older brother, Chris Jr. Um, ah. And my experiences started coming around a little bit later in the following weeks or months. But um as far as dad and junior, so that night, January 8th, um, they were out fishing on a super massive river in North Carolina. It's like 70 to 100 miles long, spans almost the entire state. And um, it crosses all the way through our hometown, which is Fayetteville, North Carolina. And um, there's there's lots of uh, secluded points where you can go in there in the woods and just sort of fish, you know, away from society, a mile from any sort of traffic or homes or anything like that. So my dad and my brother, who at the time was, I want to say he was 16 or 17, going on 17, and three of my dad's subcontractors, they had just finished a, um, like a remodeling job out here where I, you know, closer where I live at the beach now, and they go home to Fayetteville, happy to, you know, collect that paycheck off the job, and they're like, let's go fishing. So they're out on a, what seems to be an ordinary night fishing on the river, and um, it changed our lives forever. So my dad at the time, just for a little bit of context, was in probably the darkest period of his life at this point, um, surviving many near-death encounters and going from being a successful millionaire entrepreneur to in the you know year before basically losing it all and our family going bankrupt. Um, it was just a really tough time for us as a family. And my father was uh, just ready to end his life. He was he was just ready to give up. And he was out there not really having a good time. And um, my bro, you know, he's trying to hold it together for my brother and, you know, the, the subcontractor friends. And so they're all fishing. They're all trying to have a good time. And my dad's just like not feeling the the uh, festivities of the night. So he kind of walks away from the group and starts going back up the trail where it's just wide enough. We're talking deep in the woods, um, you know, surrounded by trees and, you know, uh, half a mile off the road. And he's, th there's only enough space for one car at any given time, you know, to go one way or the other. So he's walking up this very thick wooded trail. It's about a 15 minute walk. And as he's walking up this trail away from the riverbank, he's kind of hearing these rustling sounds in uh in the in the bushes and in in the trees and it, it kind of makes his hair stand up he's he's thinking to himself this isn't natural i've never heard anything like this my dad was an avid hunter an avid fisherman he had you know anything from turkeys to bear to deer to dove whatever you could think of he's he's hunted it and he he's you know typically wasn't afraid of the woods but this was the first moment in his life where he felt that fearful sensation what you know is something following me and he would walk a few feet and then he would stop and the rustling would stop. 
He would walk a few feet. The rustling would stop when he stopped. He'd get down on his hands and knees and he's looking around like, what is that sound? He just can't figure it out. So he, he kind of sucks it up and he keeps walking. And about 15 minutes later, he gets to the top of the hill where there's like a gate for, you know, a car to um, enter this trail to go to the riverbank. And when he gets to the top and he can peek over the hill at the sky and the horizon, he sees these two super massive um, orange, what appeared to be like balls of fire on, on the horizon where like the sun would be. Um, it's, I don't know, 100, 200 yards away. Couldn't have been more than that, but it, you know, it's sitting up there. His first thought is like, that's the sun. Wait a minute. There's not two suns. So he freaks out. He, in that split second, he turns like he's going to run. And then when he looks back, he sees a third one shoots up on the horizon. And then from that moment, when he, the next thing he remembers is being back at the campfire and everyone's freaking out. Where have you been? You've been gone for hours. It's completely pitch black night. Now um, it was about four 30 or five. When he walked up the hill, it was just bordering twilight and the sun was setting. Now he gets back. It's like 11 p.m. This isn't clicking in his brain. He's not he's never heard of missing time. He's not understanding what happened. And, you know, meanwhile, when he gets back to the campfire, Chris Jr. starts running out of the woods. Frantic, absolutely in a state of shock and panic. I saw these creatures in the woods, Dad. They had me there for hours. They had red eyes. They were like, you know, I don't know what they were. They were shadowy, you know, this, that and the other. The older guys had um, at one point put out the fire, moved the truck. The truck's in a completely different area. I mean, they were looking for my dad for hours. So then simultaneously, while my dad's having his missing time experience, Chris Jr. at some point in that segment of time went looking for my dad walking around in the woods. And he saw these two uh, red orbs kind of bobbing through the woods. And as they got closer, the red orbs split into four. And then as they got even closer, he realized they were eyes and they were these shadowy, but also luminescent, um, three to four foot tall, translucent entities walking towards him. And at any given time, one of them would be staring him in the eyes. And when this was going on, he couldn't move. He was in a state of like paralysis. He still to this day doesn't know if they did that to him, if it was out of fear, if it was out of panic, he doesn't know. But he sat there for what seemed like hours while at any given time, one of these entities was staring him in the eyes. The other one was walking around, picking up, you know, Coke bottles or whatever littered trash was out there in the woods and was kind of looking at it. And the key thing about these entities is their eyes blinked. It, you know, for those watching video, their eyes blinked like this, like shutters. They would, they would blink different eyes at a time. Hmm. So... You wow. know, after, after that, um, you know, goes on for a while, then my dad comes back to the campfire and then those entities disappear and then they regroup and they all are realizing something very strange is going on. So these three subcontractors are starting to freak out. They're like, get us out of here. Like what is going on? This isn't, you know, this isn't funny. And at some point in all this chaos, one of them looks up and shouts, look, and they all look up in the sky and they see what seemed to be eight or nine very bright white lights, you know, as high up as like what a star would be. And they kind of scrambled around in the sky. And then a few of them shot over on the other side of the river and landed in the woods. <clears throat> now they're really freaking out. So they all hop in the truck. They're driving out of there as fast as they can go. And by the time they get to the top of this, um, that part we had talked about earlier with the gate to enter the trail, by the time they get to the top, one of these, I guess we'll call them crafts, are uh, in the road blocking their truck and they slam to a halt. And my dad always told me it was like Dukes of Hazard. I mean, they literally were, you know, freaking out so bad the truck left the ground when they're <laughs> driving over this hill. I mean, they were airborne. And anyway, so they, they slam to a halt. One of these things is blocking the trail. Eventually it moves. They're all thinking it's the end of the world. The guys are fighting to you know, go home first to see their wife and kids for the last time before, you know, the end. Wow. And it, it, it's just pure chaos. So skipping over a few details, because it's a very long story. Um, those guys, after being dropped off one by one, my dad and my brother get home. At the time, myself, my other older brother, 
Jeremy and my sister, Emily, and my mom, we were across town staying at my, my mom's mom's house at my grandma's house. So my dad and my brother were alone uh, at the home. And when they get home, they're freaking out. They're turning on all the lights. They're grabbing all the shotguns. Remember, we were avid hunters. So we had probably a dozen rifles and guns and things like that. They're grabbing all the guns, all the rifles, all the shotguns. They're, they're thinking they have to defend themselves. And anyway, so they're locking all the doors, shutting all the blinds. And my dad starts hearing um, the hunting dogs and the kennel in the backyard start going frantic. And Junior's begging dad, please don't go out there. Please don't go out there. My dad says, I got to see what's out there. Someone could be robbing the, you know, the, the shed out there. I, I, I got to go see what's going on. He takes our Chesapeake Bay Retriever, big, big uh, hunting dog that was, you know, kind of trained a little bit. And he takes the dog, he goes out there and Rose, the dog starts acting up like she senses something in the woods. So dad says, go get it. So dad runs around the bushes. Uh, you know, we, we lived on a six acre property with really thick woods in our backyard. Essentially, it was like two acres of, of uh, lawn and, and houses and things like that. And then the rest was all woods. So the dog runs in through the woods. My dad runs around this wooded area, gets to the back and then sees an entity. One of those entities that my brother junior saw, well, it was face to face with my dad in the backyard. So long story short, you know, that's, that's the end of the first night. When dad sees this thing, he's shocked and he says, okay, you've got me. And the entity communicated to him through his thoughts. You don't understand. We're not here to hurt you. We're here to help you. Mm. So he, interesting. So he gets back to the house. Really thinking it's over. One last time he looks out the blinds, kind of peeking through to see you know, if there's anything else out there. And he sees a seven to eight foot tall entity walking to the backyard. Um, towards the window slams the window shut he and my brother hop in a truck they drive away and they go sleep overnight in a cornfield wake up the next day thinking that people would be receptive to it he tells his my speaking of my dad he tells his mom and dad tells um, some other people they just laugh it off you're crazy you're on drugs whatever so that didn't go over well and then that day passes by the third day there's one more encounter where he hears um, kind of ruckus in the backyard again. The hunting dogs are barking. He sees lights. And my dad says, I got to end this. So he grabs a rifle. He runs out to the backyard. When he gets closer to where the light is, he's kind of struck with this sort of like paralyzing fear. And he, he realizes he can't go forward, drops the rifle, whatever, decides to go forward. And then he sees one of those entities again. Um, from the previous nights has a triangle on its chest it's glowing like the moon translucent shimmering same thing the eyes you know they blink like shutters one by one and it kind of conveys the sense to my father to never hunt again never kill again um, never harm life all life is sacred it's a part of special divine creation and you know what what truly matters is complete compassion towards all life and this is impressed upon him. And true story, my dad never hunted again. He never killed another creature. He would he would pick up bugs and kind of scurry them out of the house. He would <laughs> lecture us if we killed little critters and things like yeah. that. I mean, it just it changed him forever. And then there's even more experiences past that. But that's uh, that's the initial encounter, pretty quickly summarized. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's incredible. Um, <clears throat> I mean. You know, I did meet your father at, at one of these UFO conferences and uh, unfortunately I didn't have a, a lot of time to speak with him. But, uh, you know, I, I, I certainly believe that all these things did happen. There's no question about it in my mind. Um, and uh, the, uh, the residual effects of it are what's, what's interesting to me, too, because <clears throat> our organization is, you know, been set up to help people having these types of experiences. And a lot of times people like your dad and your brother uh, don't know where to turn uh, for help mm -hmm. in, in these kind of uh, scenarios. So, um, you know, it, it's fascinating, you know, to, to have these uh, entities, these non-human intelligences tell your father, you know, we're here to help you. And, uh, you know, what, was there any, you know, kind of a revelation in that regard as far as what kind of help they were, were talking about? 
Uh, I mean, how, how deep do you want to go? Because um, the, the experiences continued past that and, and mm -hmm. more sort of like communication events happened. Um, he did end up having a hypnotic regression in, I want to say 2008. Um, Cause so his initial experience happened in January of 2007. Um, it took him about 10 months to report this to any organization because he was, he was terrified he was going to lose his family. His children would be mm -hmm. taken away. My mother initially was not receptive to this. She thought it was, you know, demonic or whatever. And um, he was kind of like a laughing stock when he would tell people about this. And he right. just, he just locked himself in his room for nearly a year. And one night he and I, and, and a couple of my other siblings, we were, we became obsessed with watching UFO shows on TV, just trying to understand what happened to us. And, you know, we're all young kids. We're thinking what we see on TV is going to be true. And um, we see flashed on the screen, MUFON.com. If you've had a sighting, report your experience. So my dad types up his um, encounter to MUFON. And it was within a week or two that they were like very fascinated and wanted to come out to our property. Dad kind of held off on it for a few months. He was like, I don't know if I want to go through a full blown investigation. Mm -hmm. Eventually caved in. And then very quickly after that, um, within probably six months, um, the Discovery Channel was on our property filming a full blown um, documentary about us. And in that time, the Discovery Channel and MUFON together had funded a uh, Harvard psychologist named Michael O'Connell to come out and do a hypnotic regression. So when that happened, dad was able to recall his, um, his missing time, the mm. initial night of the river. And then it was kind of suggested to him that over time, the memories would come back, you know, they'd take the form of, of dreams and initially be able to consciously recall. So it wouldn't shock his brain and that going forward, his experiences would be conscious. So Moving forward, after the documentary aired, it was a terrible shock. I mean, they totally butchered us to death. They were very deceptive in the way they portrayed the data and edited um, the documentary. They totally unethically abused the lie detector, made it look like dad was untruthful. And um, wow. so for the following several years, we were just totally broken as a family. I mean, being totally ridiculed and abused and just mistreated by people. And meanwhile, there would be some people reaching out to us in private, wanting to come to the property, wanting to have experiences. And many of them did. So leading up to 2012, my dad was so sick of the ridicule, sick of us kids getting mocked in school and harassed and bullied. So he just kind of said, um, I'm done with this. I'm done with the experiences. I don't want to talk about this ever again. I'm just going to walk away from this and try to have a normal life. And that night, it was actually Easter weekend. Um, it was either uh, Saturday night leading into Easter or it was Sunday night leading into Monday after Easter. I can't remember. But either way, Easter weekend, 2012, he wakes up at three in the morning to a voice that says, arise, gets some, you know, shocks him out of bed, instructs him to get dressed and come outside. And when he steps out in the backyard, um, these entities, not the little short ones, but the tall ones that he was able to recall you know, the, like when he peeked out the blinds, you know, and he saw these seven, eight foot tall ones. Well, these seven to eight foot tall entities were the ones who were with him um, during that missing time event. And he was able to see them consciously. I mean, he was completely lucid during this experience. They were in the backyard. They, they said, follow us. They handed them this little thing. It, it's, it, it, he describes it as being like, kind of like the body of a small dog, like a chihuahua but it had no head, no legs, no tail, just like a torso. And it had spikes on it. It was kind of gnashing and it was writhing and he would touch it and it wouldn't hurt him. And he's, he, he didn't, he didn't want to hold on to it, but they said, don't lose this. This is your burden. And he would hold it. And it was, it was kind of making him uncomfortable, gnashing at him or whatever. So he walks to the backyard to our uh, dog kennels and he throws it in there and he locks the kennel. When he hmm. turns around, um, he sees a bull like a massive transparent ethereal bull and it charges through him, knocks him over great gust of wind. He kind of rolls over to get up on his hands and knees and he looks up and actually, if you know, for those watching the video, you can see it depicted here. He sees a blonde haired blue eyed woman in a white gown from her neck all the way down to her ankles floating about a foot off the ground. And she says, you know, why I'm here. 
this, this, these experiences are your burden. You have to tell your story. And she goes on to explain to him that um, basically the age of Aquarius is coming and that there are some potential cataclysms that will, you know, without getting into detail, um, essentially wipe us out if we don't change as a species, mm -hmm. if we don't, if we don't shun the fearful vibration that we're currently in and sort of like realize that love is the answer, then, uh, you know, we won't, we won't live to see the next <clears throat> age. So she said, go out, tell your story, talk about the age of Aquarius and, and, and the new knowledge coming, and we're going to help you. We're going to, uh, help you have cameras and witnesses to, um, give proof to the world. These, these, um, I, I mean, that, that's, that's an incredible story and, and one that, uh, resonates very, very much with me. And uh, when you say your, your dad saw these tall uh, entities, what, what did they look like? Uh, were they more like the, the uh, picture you have behind you or were, were they totally different? They were different. They didn't appear to be human. And um, that night that he saw them in 2012, they actually appeared to be glowing and um, they glowed like light. And there was another encounter he had in 2013, where when he was close to them, they looked kind of like they weren't glowing, like the initial encounter. They looked, they, they appeared to be physical, but then they would remove what looked like a cloak and they would be glowing pure light. And mm. they gave the, they gave the impression that they were sort of like angelic or angels. Mm -hmm. And they told him that they serve creation and that they are the guardians of mankind and they oversee our um, evolution throughout the ages. They take care of us. They protect us from danger. And um, they basically make sure that we're all right for many sort of external forces. And I um, mean, th that is, that is, that is incredible. Um, <clears throat> because there, there's certainly <clears throat> time right now in our, in our, in our, our lives that is very critical. I think there's a lot of danger involved, you know, with us in China, us in Russia, uh, all kinds of possibilities uh, of, you know, tragedies occurring in the near future. And so if we have some kind of guidance, uh, some kind of protection, uh, that would be incredible. And I think part of this whole process that's going on right now, Ryan, is, is the fact that People like yourself have been tapped, have been uh, caused to to come out and and talk, tell your story, and 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 make people aware of of what what's happening. And and I and I think that uh, you know all I can say to you is thank you uh, for you know your your courage and and basically coming out and and talking about this topic because to me it it's a whole new paradigm. Uh, it's a different reality that uh, we don't, we don't fully understand, but it, it's real. It's very real. It's happening to millions and millions of people. <laughs> so, um, you know, so, I, you know, I, the story, like I say, is, is just phenomenal. And um, I know that there was a lot more going on um, beyond that, uh, especially with the, uh, government intervention. Can you kind of dip into that a little bit? <clears throat> yes. So, um, and by the way, I appreciate the kind words, Lester. That means a lot, truly. Um, so it, it was essentially <clears throat> around 2009, maybe like, more like Christmas of 2008. Uh, we had a knock on the door one day and it was a NASA scientist by the name of Hal Pobenmeyer. And that was the first that uh, showed up from the government to investigate us. And as the years continued, we began to meet a plethora of characters from different elements of the Department of Defense, like NASA, the CIA, the NRO, Air Force Intelligence, Army Intelligence, the NSA, Homeland Security, the DIA, Australian Intelligence, British Intelligence, it, it goes on and on, um, wow. Assad, um, even people who back in the old days before the CIA was a thing were OSS, which is the office of special mm -hmm. services. We even had some of those guys poke around. It's not an active agency anymore. It was the precursor to the CIA. But the point is we've had a, a bunch of different people from different agencies knock on our door, literally like come to the house just to get information from us to talk to us, to see us. And later um, 
a, a character by the name of Jim Simivan, a very, very high ranking, mm-hmm. distinguished uh, senior, int- let me get this right, senior service intelligence official, um, meaning he's like one of the directors of entire CIA programs. He later, one night in our backyard, plainly told me and my brothers and my parents and my sister to our faces that the uh, director of MUFON at the time who created the documentary was, quote, a low-level CIA spook sent in to um, hatchet our family with the documentary. It was, it was pretty much a government operation. And, hmm. um, and, and the reason is because I, I believe it was 2016 when, um, when the government started, or maybe it was 2017, when the government started coming out with all these, you know, videos of Tic Tacs, right. started acknowledging that there was other sort of like paranormal phenomenon out there. That was the first time in U.S. history in any official capacity that they had acknowledged the existence of anything. I'm talking government, not people like you and me talking about this. I'm saying government departments never officially acknowledge this stuff until about the year 2017. And that's probably the reason why they hatcheted my family story so bad, you know, considering the documentary came out in 2008. Anyway, so especially after 2012, when um, my dad started having experiences with this, this female entity, the CIA started swarming us like crazy. I mean, multiple people uh, started coming to our property to get information, running experiments, doing different sort of like psi experiments, meaning like psychic research and things like that. And um, they had determined that my dad had different uh, psychic capabilities, like remote viewing. And he's very humble about this and doesn't like to talk about it. He writes about it in his book. But um, there were some instances where people were sort of like accidentally, miraculously healed of things like cancer and and, uh, strokes and things like that. And um, yeah, so that's, that's, Kind of when the government stuff started happening was when when NASA knocked on the door and then um, like, is there anything specific you wanted me to go into about well, the government? Just, well, let, let me just back up a second here. Uh, one one person that I, I was wondering about was uh, Richard Lang. You met? Did you re- meet Richard Lang from uh, MUFON? Did. Does that name sound familiar? Yeah, he 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 was uh, one of the head investigators that that did the documentary. Yes. Okay. And do you feel that he was involved with uh, doing a hatchet job on you guys? Yes, I do. Really? Oh, that's interesting. Huh. Wow. That that's uh, that, that's a lot for me to take in right now because I know Richard. Okay, <laughs> to be you know perfectly clear here, and. Um, um, uh, he seemed to be someone that was uh, uh, a person that would be not involved with something like that. I mean, I mean, he he would certainly want to know the facts and, and try to understand the facts. But be that as it may, um, that's quite a revelation, <laughs> Ryan. So, uh, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that you know, moving further into this whole thing. You know, you mentioned a couple of things about your father being able to heal people, uh, having these psychic abilities, uh, being able to remote view. And I mean, these these are things that uh, many people uh, that have been abducted uh, come back with um, the ability to do those kind of things, which which to me is phenomenal, uh, number one, but also how incredibly helpful that is to to humankind to be able to do things like that and to help your fellow man. Um, and, and so have now, has any of that worn off on you, Ryan? I mean, you know, is this something that uh, has uh, caused you to uh, uh, have different uh, capabilities? I wouldn't say that I, you know, have psychic abilities or anything of that nature. It's not like I'm able to like remote view or, or, or do anything like that on command. But I will say there have been instances where very spooky things have happened by accident that can only be explained by some sort of psychic phenomenon. But mm-hmm. I, I don't have any level of mastery or control or really even any understanding of, of how this stuff operates. I just know that sometimes at the right place at the right time, strange things happen sometimes. And to the people mm-hmm. around me, you know, synchronistic experiences, sometimes 
like today, for example, um, my wife was uh, just doing work at home and she was watching a video and I was just goofing, you know, she has headphones in and I'm just goofing around and I'm saying something that popped into my head to her. And she turns around and she said, can you hear what's in my headphones? And I said, no. And apparently the thing that popped into my head was exactly what she heard on her headphones. And, you know, huh. things like things like that happen all the time, but, um, you know, it's, it's not anything that I've consciously developed or, or know how to do or even really understand, but it, I would say it's rubbed off on me. I've, I've had plenty of entity experiences. Yeah, and, and I think that these are types of things that do, do run in families. There's no question about it. And it's generational uh, that these things occur. Um, but getting back to the, uh, the uh, three-letter organizations that have uh, frequented your doorsteps, um, how did they leave this with you? I mean, what did they did they say? Well, we're coming back later on, or they just came in, did their thing, and then that's it. See you later, Jack. <laughs> some of them were like that. Um, some of them were not. I will say the people like you know your friend you had mentioned earlier who did the MUFON mm -hmm. organization. They made a lot mm -hmm. of promises, and then they just left us high and dry to be uh, basically slaughtered by the public. And I will say, speaking of your friend, um, he mm -hmm. actually did recently text us. I'm talking within the last two months, um, mm -hmm. apologizing for being involved in the cover-up. But mm. anyway, you know that's another story. Yeah. But yeah, um, I, and I, I, I'm not surprised that 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 occurred because I think there was some some pressure from higher up, if you will, that caused that to probably happen in that way. But I I think that uh, his apology is probably very very uh, uh, meaningful and uh, genuine. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it may be, but we were children whose lives were nearly yeah. destroyed, you know? Yeah. So it's like, I can only, you know, yeah. I, I, I can take an apology, but at the same time, yeah. it's, you know, it's like, when, when are we going to, yeah. you know, be compassionate human beings, sure. to no. a family of children having really experiences, but oh, anyway, some of them, some of them were like that. Some of them mm -hmm. were just completely ruthless and, and stepped over us like we were ants. And then some of them, characters like Jim Simi Van and Hal Pavemeyer, they were very open, very heartwarming, um, loving, um, just so nice and kind and would go out of their way to, um, you know, under, make us understand that they were with these government programs and try to be clear about their intentions and even, you know, try to make connections behind closed doors and, and, and help us with things like the book. I mean, some of them, some of these characters like Dr. John Alexander and Jim Simi Van actually wrote forwards and introductions in my dad's book. I mean, they, they weren't all bad. You know, there yeah. was a time, there was a time when I believed they all were, but they weren't. And mm -hmm. um, anyway, and then some of them acted a certain way and then they would burn us, you know, when they got the information and they would never talk to us again. And um, some of them, you know, some people involved with the CIA and the DIA even threatened our lives if we ever spoke publicly again. And oh, naturally, really? what did I do? I, I was so enraged. I went and I started my own podcast and I said, you know what? You're not going to do anything to me. You're not going to do anything to me. I'm going to go talk and you guys are going to, you guys are going to listen and you guys are going to sit there and sweat because I'm going to get my story out. And it worked. That's really, that's really interesting that they're still doing things like that. Um, uh, do. You know, trying to keep the lid on things. Um, you know, people have asked me as far as my organization, have I ever been approached? And, and the bottom line is that no, I have not been because I think it, it's what we're doing. Uh, you know, in our in our mission to help people uh, is keeping a lid on things for them. They don't have to worry <laughs> worry about these people that are having these experiences going outside and and trying to. Uh, you know, tell the, uh, you know, the public about what's going on. But, and so in one respect, it's, it's a good thing that we're helping these people, but it, it, the flip side is that the fact that these people do need to be telling their stories. And uh, my, my book that I wrote a couple of years ago, The Unknown Other and the Existential Proposition of Alien Contact, has about 25 stories in there from people that have been in our support group. Um, uh, and, and telling their stories about what happened to them and how Opus helped them. But uh, I, 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 you know, again, Ryan, I'm, I'm so thankful for you and, and, and your father for, you know, going through all of this. And, and, and uh, I mean, it, it was, I can't imagine the, the, uh, uh, 
the kind of things that you've gone through to get through this process. Um, you know, you mentioned Jim Semivan, and, and uh, um, at, at the time when he approached you, was he a, a member, still a member of the CIA, or was this as, as, as a totally uh, separate organization? Technically, um, in an official capacity, he was retired. But, mm -hmm. you know, come to find out, growing up around CIA officers, technically, they're never fully retired. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a, a thing on his part to, to consciously determine, or, or, or I would say consciously to decide to meet us after he was, so to speak, retired, because mm -hmm. it's supposedly, according to them, whether we know if they're telling the truth or not, I don't know. But according to them, if you ask somebody who works in the CIA, they're going to tell you it's illegal uh, for the CIA to domestically approach civilians covertly because technically mm -hmm. if you go if you go look at their policies the fbi is supposed to be domestic right. and the cia is supposed to be international so it could have gotten him in a lot of trouble if he was still a covert you know agent right. and approached us without you know revealing who he is his classifications his position and um this guy is uh was the director of the spy program he wrote many of the policies for being a clandestine spy in the clandestine department of, or, or whatever you want to call it for the CIA. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it was director of clandestine, clandestine operations. Yeah, operations, very by the book policy guy. So what he told yeah. us is, you know, he waited, I asked him, I said, when did you hear about us? When did you find out about us? And he kind of smiled. Um, yeah. me, me being a very rebellious teenager who was so kind of, you know, mad at the government for basically you know, people like yeah. Richard and, and the MUFON people leaving us to be slaughtered by the public and, you know, trying to ruin us with a cover up documentary. I didn't care. I didn't I, I would ask whatever question I wanted. I felt like I, I deserve to know the answer. I, I don't care. I don't care what you I don't care if you're the pope. I'm going to ask you, you know, I feel like I have a right to know if you're investigating me. And I would ask him all these kinds of questions and try to pin him to the wall. And he would kind of like grin and like you, you're such a you're such a he would tell me things like you're such a a rebellious you know this is why i hate kids and he'd be laughing and <laughs> anyway he told me um he said well if you want to know the truth i found out about you the second that your uh that your your dad reported to mufon back in 2008 but um you know i was active all those years so i had to wait until i was retired and long story short it had been arranged for us to bump into each other at a bar mitzvah in New York city through a mutual friend. And we met him. Oh, cool. Wow. Nice to meet you here. We were, we were with a, another friend, kind of like a millionaire, billionaire philanthropist type guy uh, or venture venture capitalist. And we were with him at a bar mitzvah. And then he just kind of introduces us to his friend, but we later found out it was all arranged um, for him to have a way to meet us without breaking any sort of policy or CIA rules. And um, that's how he came into the picture. And then we remained friends for many years and we still keep in touch. Um, he and I actually have the same birthday. So every year, at least once a year, we talk <laughs> on birthday. Oh, that's great. That's great. You know, it, it, it's interesting. The, the fact that you mentioned that he, he said that he w got familiar with your case the minute it hit the MUFON, <laughs> hit MUFON. Yeah. And so, he, you know, right there that the uh, CIA is monitoring the, the MUFON uh, uh, you know, uh, site for sure. Um, also, um, uh, MUFON has CIA in it. They're, they're not just a yeah. Dory civilian organization. That's completely untrue. Yeah. yeah. It's just not true. Yeah. I, I agree. So, um, did you ever have the FBI actually show up on your doorstep? Not to my knowledge, but my dad has actually met FBI people through these experiences but not on our property no 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 fbi agent has come to our property and if mm -hmm. they did we did we weren't aware they were fbi um yeah. the guy that ran the lie detector test was fbi uh-huh oh interesting interesting so with with all of this going on now where where are you at in your life with all of this and where is your dad at with all of this well, um, my dad just released a number one best-selling book called UFO of God. Um, it just it's been out for about a month, month and a half now, month and a couple weeks or so, and um, it's doing phenomenally well. I'm so proud of him. Um, he self-published it. It took him about a year to write it. 
And honestly, none of us knew what was going to be in it. And then it came out and um, it, it, it's even us as his family, you know, reading it for the first time, we were just blown away and, and, and so thankful for how he told our story. And he's, he's really um, kind of day in and day out dealing with that at the moment, the, the reception of that uh, kind of going on interviews and, and, and speaking about that. And um, in the meantime, I'm doing my podcast, Bledsoe Said So, to sort of get the story out there, promote the book. Um, and we sort of lean into each other and help each other out with our ventures. He's got his book. I've got my podcast and some other upcoming things um, can't say too much about, but we do have some other things that will be uh, pretty soon coming out in the, uh, the public eye. So, and, um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, and then the last thing in the meantime, I've just for fun, I've started a, a, a band called Twice Born and we're kind of that's our side projects so of the podcast is the main thing. And then the band is the side thing. And just, just trying to, just trying to get the story out there and heal from all the damage that MUFON and the discovery channel and many of these bad actors and these government agencies have, have uh, caused to us. Yeah. Just yeah. trying to heal. Well, you know, th th this is the thing that, you know, I did, I did a study years ago with 71 people that had been abducted and the 51 people that were a, uh, uh, control group that was called the Omega-3 study. <clears throat> and what happens with people that have these experiences, their worldview changes dramatically. And the, the common thread that in all of these experiences is that people, when they come out of this, feel that they we need to be better stewards of the planet. We need to take care of the planet. We need to be better to one another. We need to love one another. We, I mean, these are all really positive types of things. And so the whole thing becomes a spiritual journey, not a religious journey, but a spiritual journey mm -hmm. that, that is very significant. And, and so if we could all think that way, then we would probably not have wars. We would not need all this armament that's going on. We wouldn't need to be worried about the Russians or the Chinese or any, any, any aggressors for that matter. Even, you know, even the aliens, uh, if you will, or these non-human intelligences uh, that, you know, there's always a couple of sides to the coin. You know, you have the people that are feel that they're all bad and, and the people that feel that they're all good. Well, I think it's a mixture, just like we have here on the planet. We have good people, we have bad people. And, and so we need to be able to discern that whole, that whole thing. And, and so... I think that based on what I'm hearing uh, that you and your dad and your brother uh, had uh, experiences with turned out to be a positive thing for them. Would you would you uh, agree with that? Yes, the, the experiences were positive. At, at first, they were scary. They were shocking. Yeah. You know, no, yeah. no, I don't I don't believe mortals you know, in this day and age are used to experiencing this kind of thing. It's 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 stuff you read in fairy tales or, or religious books. I mean, this right. This right. isn't stuff that, you know, people normally experience. And, and at first it's very scary because you, you don't know what you're experiencing. But um, over the years, the, the entities have, have performed very miraculous things. Like I had mentioned earlier, you know, healing mm -hmm. people of cancers and many other blessings and, and things like that. And they've, they've proven time and time again in the last 16 years that they're very benevolent, ultimately compassionate, loving beings. And truthfully, Lester, the people who made this experience a living hell where the ordinary people that we knew that rejected us and told us we were crazy, we're demonic, mm -hmm. we're liars, we're on drugs, whatever, yeah. whatever. The people that are very strictly into a specific religious system like Christianity or even atheism, um, who wouldn't listen to us simply because it, it didn't jive with their worldview. And then also, you know, coupling that with the bad actors in the government who intentionally made us look bad and, you know, documentary and things like that. So that we would be ridiculed. So it's it's you know long story short, it's been the people that have been terrible and evil. Yeah, it's not been the entities. Yeah, well, <clears throat> and 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 I, and I think this is a, this is a, a a great place to to uh, kind of put a, a a period on our our conversation tonight. I think that uh, this has been absolutely uh, mind blowing. My you know the, the revelations have been incredible. Uh, you've you've confirmed a lot of things uh, that experiencers are talking about, uh, especially in our our group. We you know we Opus has a online support group 
uh, we have over 300 people from around the world. It's totally confidential, talking 24-7 to one, one another. Uh, we have a referral network of mental health practitioners, hypnotherapists, uh, psychotherapists. And then we have a, a group called the EST, which is our experiencer support team, which talks to these people when they come into us to understand what it is they're looking for. What kind of help are they looking for? So, <clears throat> you know, I think your dad and your brothers would have would have really benefited uh, uh, by connecting with us at that point. But, you know, the thing is, we're a nonprofit, we're not a huge organization. And so trying to get the word out about what, we, what we're doing is so important. So this is why we're doing these interview series to talk to people like yourself that are close to these kind of things and obviously affected by these things. And so all I can say to you, Ryan, is thank you again uh, for being here. I, I am so grateful uh, for the opportunity to chat with you tonight. And, um, you know, I want to thank our listeners. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, as I said, we're a nonprofit organization, so we depend on donations. So if you hit our website at opusnetwork.org, there's a little donate button. We would appreciate it. And uh, Ryan, to, to, to close this out, would you like to talk about anything as far as your father's book and, and anything else that, that would be important to the listeners? Uh, well, first of all, I, I do want to say thank you very much once again for the kind words, Lester. I mean, I, I'm sure you hear this all the time, but I really sincerely mean it. Thank you for inviting me on and being so kind and being so thoughtful and listening and just letting me, you know, share my piece. And I, I really appreciate that. And and I can't thank you enough for that. Um, as far as the book goes, um, I would just say, you know, to people who are curious about what it would truly look like in modern times for a men in black type organization to study an ordinary family who's having high level entity experiences. If, if you want to learn the truth about that and how that goes down and what that looks like, check out my dad's book. It's called UFO of God. And when you crack it open, you get right to the introduction and you'll see right there in the beginning, CIA officer, Jim Simivan, Directorate of Operations, uh, says right there, Chris Bledsoe and his family have probably been officially and unofficially visited by more government types, researchers, academics, scientists uh, than anyone in history because of the experiences they've had as a family and they're incredible people. And I believe them to be telling the truth. That's not my words, that's his. So I would say if you guys really want to read a high level riveting book about UFOs, check out my dad's book. It will blow your mind. It'll change your life. Ryan, thank you so much. It's it's been a fantastic, and uh, definitely, I'll be getting that book right away <laughs> for sure. <laughs> thank you. Okay. I, I appreciate you, Lester. You bet. Thank you, Ryan. Take and have a good evening. <laughs>